maybe we can start. So it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have uh, Didier, Didier Clamont from uh, University of uh, Côte d'Azur. And he will speak about what the wave uh, determination from seabed measurement. So please, uh, Clamont. Thank Didier. you very much for the invitation. Um, as I said earlier, I wanted to come, but unfortunately the condition uh, didn't allow that. So I give this uh, presentation online. So I'm talking about uh, water wave, uh, surf, uh, sea waves determination from uh, probes put at the bottom of the sea. Uh, this is a typical uh, inversion problem. So, but bef before I start, if my computer wants to work, let me acknowledge the, my collaborators. Uh, first, Adrian Constantin, uh, who uh, initiated this research and uh, David uh, Henry that uh, helped me uh, giving the final answer to this work. So what was the motivation for that? The motivation was to um, ease actually, to uh, monitor the, the state of the, the sea, the, the wave field on the sea. This, this is uh, very important for many uh, environmental issues with global warming and more and more storm. We need to, to monitor the, the state of the sea. And for that, we need measurements. And uh, these measurements must be uh, convenient, uh, easy, uh, easily maintained and so on. So it's not very practical to put a buoy, floating buoys, for example, or probes that are on the surface because they are visible and they can disturb uh, uh, boats or they cannot be nice looking. Uh, you can have also, uh, it's possible to have submerged uh, probes, but uh, there is a problem with, uh, there may be problem with uh, fishing boats as well, or uh, a lot of safety issues. Um, related to that. And it's a matter of cost. So the solution the engineers found the most convenient is to put pressure, pressure gauges at the, on the seabed. And another big advantage, and that is probably the, the principal reason for doing that is that they are more difficult to steal. So they are safe put on the bottom of the sea. Nobody knows where they are. So the idea is then to measure the pressure at the, at the bottom of the sea. And then from this pressure measurement is to recover the, the free surface from this data. So the question is, that's the idea, but uh, how do you do that? And this is what I, I want to talk about. So, but uh, just to put uh, the, the problem into place, we have a typical water wave problem with a seabed uh, at a certain depth that we don't know. We don't know exactly what's the depth uh, uh, at a given point. What we know is the pressure at the bottom, that's called PB, P bottom, that's given data. And this is pretty much the only information we have. We know the acceleration due to gravity, G, uh, 9.81 uh, uh, meter per second squared, but the rest we don't know. For example, we know that uh, the, the pressure uh, in the fluid P from the Euler equation can be obtained from the Euler equation. And we know that it satisfies a Poisson-like equation. The problem here is that this Poisson equation has a right-hand side that depends uh, non-linearly on the velocity. But uh, the most difficult part is not that it's non-linear, is that the velocity field is unknown because we don't record velocity. All we have is the bottom pressure. And then we need to determine the shape of the, the free surface. That's the blue, uh, the blue line on the, on the sketch. And we know there that the pressure is zero, but we don't know the shape of this curve. And this is what we want to, to find out. So we have little information and we have to extrapolate our data. Uh, we don't have more data to make this extrapolation, but we have theory, we have mathematical model, and this is what we are going to use to be able to extrapolate this bottom pressure to get the profile of the free surface. So of course, it's a model. So we have to make some assumptions and uh, assumptions that are convenient for doing mathematics. So first we consider 
a two-dimensional problem. We consider a permanent flow. That means um, if we consider that we have a traveling wave, a wave that is traveling at a constant speed without changing form. And we, we set ourselves in the frame of reference moving with the wave. So in that frame of reference, the, the wave is frozen in time. So there is no time dependence here. So it's a, a simplification, which is quite uh, reasonable for some applications. And we consider the fluid perfect, means there is no viscosity and that the density is constant. Another simplification is that we assume that the motion is irrotational and that the seabed is flat and horizontal. And I will call D the depth, the mean depth, that is unknown a priori, G the acceleration of gravity that is given, the pressure divided, P is the pressure divided by the density, which is known only at the bottom, X and Y are the Cartesian coordinate, U and V are the velocity components, uh, uh, horizontal and vertical, and phi and psi are respectively the velocity potential and the stream function. And eta is the shape of the free surface that we are looking for. So uh, this velocity potential and stream function are introduced because they uh, uh, fulfill automatically the irrotationality and the uh, incompressibility conditions. So if the flow is irrotational, the curl of the velocity field is zero. So by introducing uh, a potential phi is such that the velocity phi field is the gradient of this potential, then the curl condition is automatically satisfied. And for the incompressibility, it means that the divergence of the velocity field, uh, field is zero. So introducing a stream function such that its curl is uh, zero, we automatically fulfill this uh, incompressibility condition. So that's the first line, the U uh, and V definition in terms of the potential and the stream function. And in this uh, relation, uh, you have recognized probably the Cauchy-Riemann condition. And this is why also we make this hypothesis because we get these conditions that will help us to use a powerful mathematical tools. So I will come back to that. For the seabed, we assume that the sea is not leaking and huh? there is no, the water is staying in the sea, so the, the, the bottom is impermeable, means that the normal uh, velocity that here is vertical is zero. Similarly, the free surface is impermeable. And we have a, a condition at the free surface that the pressure is zero. So there is no wind effect here, no capillary effect. So this uh, zero pressure is given by the Bernoulli equation at the free surface. That is the last equation here. So the Bernoulli equation is just uh, a first integral of the Euler equation of motion. And as a general notation, I denote with subscript B like bottom, the quantity written at the bed, and S like surface, the quantity written at the free surface. And uh, subscript X denotes the derivative with respect of X. Okay, so this is our hypothesis. Oops. Okay. Yeah. And I have to put some further assumption. I will consider 2 pi over k periodic wave. So k is a wave number. It's not a restriction because if we have a periodic wave like a solitary wave, we can let k goes to zero. And uh, I choose the origin of my uh, coordinate system such that y equal to zero correspond to the still water level. So then the free surface, uh, the equation uh, y equal eta of x of the free surface uh, as zero average. And then uh, by averaging the pressure condition at the free surface, it gives us a definition of the Bernoulli constant B that appears into the equation. And it gives us as well, the, this uh, condition gives us a definition of the depth as the average pressure on the bed. So knowing the, the bottom pressure by averaging it, we instant, uh, automatically get the, the mean water depth. So one unknown has been removed like that very easily. Uh, the other unknown are more difficult to obtain. So, and we have the Bernoulli equation. So let's summarize in the sketch the equation. I have the bottom pressure PB that is given, the vertical velocity is zero. In the free domain, I have two kinetic and one dynamic condition. 
And uh, I have to solve equation in the domain whose shape is unknown because the upper boundary is unknown. This is what I'm looking for. And I have an equation with some velocity field that is unknown. So pretty much we have to solve an unknown equation into an unknown domain. But of course, these equations are not independent and that uh, what we will exploit to solve our problem. So at the free surface, we have the zero pressure condition that is given here. And I denote A, the amplitude of the wave, that's the, the crest height, the distance between the still water level to the maximum of the wave. And minus B is the, the trough, uh, the minimum of the, of the wave. So here are the notation. They are pretty much standard. So if you have been working with wave before, you should be familiar with uh, this equation. Okay. So these equations are nonlinear, and the first thing to do when we have to deal with nonlinear equation is to linearize them. So this is uh, reasonable when the free surface is uh, very small, so we can make a uh, linearization around the eta equal to zero, flat free surface. And when we do that, we obtain the very well-known uh, theory or airy uh, solution for uh, water waves. So the free surface is then a sinusoid, the velocity potential is sinusoidal, and the pressure P is also sinusoidal given here. And we have a relation between the Bernoulli constant and the C is the phase velocity of the wave in a frame of reference. Uh, which is called the fixed frame of reference, where the wave travel at the speed c. And we have a dispersion relation, that's the last equation in this uh, slide. Okay, so that's... Uh, so uh, I, I have a question, when, when you yes. do this, so this is linear, Yes. right? But uh, yes. if you go back one, one slide, if you go back, yeah. But when I look at this equation, I mean, it seems uh, highly nonlinear, right? Yes. So okay. I will solve the fully nonlinear problem, but I just introduced the linear solution to... to no, because I mean, problem. at least like the shape of the picture you are showing. So you are, you, 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 you are thinking of, of a shape like this, or you are sh thinking of a shape which is uh, more like periodic in X. This is periodic. It's just one period that is drawn on the on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, it repeats itself the same. That's what. Yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Of course, okay. of course. It's periodic, okay. and uh, it's also symmetrical. But in theory, we so your PB will be periodic in X. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I understand. Okay. Uh, not necessarily. It can be period because the period can be infinite. So. <laughs> so, it's not a. Uh, the pair doesn't have to be finite. So uh, we can deal with solitary wave, for instance. And I will uh, give you a solution. But uh, when the year I, I, on the sketch, you can see that the crest is higher, is uh, larger than the trough, and uh, the, the shape is more, uh, the, um, the curvature is stronger uh, on the crest. That's typical uh, signature of nonlinear waves here. But if the wave are very small, it tends, this curve tends to, to be a sinusoid that is given here. Okay. So we could use this linear theory to make a, a simple model for pressure reconstruction, but we can do even simpler is to consider hydrostatic pressure. So the idea here, it was probably the first idea that was used is to consider that the pressure at, uh, at the bottom is just the weight of the water vertically above the, the gauge. So that's hydrostatic uh, assumption. It means that the velocity has no effect on the pressure, which is not exactly true. So if you do this assumption, you have here the formula for the pressure, that's just the weight of water. And so since you know the pressure at the bottom, you deduce the free surface with the, directly from this formula. And some engineers have been testing that and they observed that even for mild amplitude wave, the error can exceed 15%, which is, uh, which can be significant for some problems. So it's too big. So the idea then to get a bit better is to consider the linear theory that's not hydrostatic. It's a better approximation. It's a first order approximation. Hydrostatic, you can consider that as a zero order approximation. So that's what Escher and uh, Schumann uh, have been doing. 
And uh, some uh, experiments shows that uh, this uh, approximation uh, overestimate the wave height, uh, the wave, uh, the height of the waves by about 10% for large waves. So it's still significant. So it, it's better than the previous one, but it's not that great. So some uh, more recently, some researchers uh, solve the or reduce the system of equation to a single ODE for the free surface. So I spare you all the algebra, it's a bit long, but when you do that the way they did it, you end up with a, an ODE that is written here where you have a square root of the unknown function and in the denominator, you have the derivative square. So it's not uh, very simple. And on the right, right hand side, you have a Fourier series where the unknown function appear, appears inside an hyperbolic cosine. So it's an exponentially growing function. When n goes to infinity, you imagine that we create troubles and the Fourier coefficient are given here by the bottom pressure. So you can solve this equation in principle numerically, that's what they did, but it's very demanding, very expensive in terms of computation and uh, there are problems of um, stability and accumulation of numerical errors and things like that. So uh, our idea was uh, to, to think since this equation are a bit complicated, before solving them uh, numerically, we probably it's better to rewrite the, the equation in a way more suitable for resolution. And this is the, the, the topic of this presentation to show you how we can uh, treat this problem. So the first idea is to use complex variables. Since I mentioned earlier, we have Cauchy-Riemann equation. So when you hear Cauchy-Riemann, you think uh, complex analysis, of course. So we introduce a complex abscissa and a complex potential and the complex velocity that is the derivative of the complex uh, potential. So with F and W, we have to deal with two holomorphic functions that are very nice. But the pressure is not an holomorphic function because the pressure is uh, not harmonic. Uh, we have seen in the beginning that uh, the pressure fulfills a Poisson equation, not a Laplace equation. So the fact that this pressure is not holomorphic is uh, a bit uh, problematic. And so we wanted to uh, uh, overcome this difficulty. So here is the idea. Since the pressure is not holomorphic, then we created a holomorphic pressure and we introduced this quantity, the gothic P defined like that from the velocity, uh, uh, complex velocity. So the right hand side is uh, holomorphic. So this function is holomorphic. And if you split real and imaginary part, you see structure in, term, uh, in terms of uh, velocity. And if you write this function at the seabed, the seabed is at Z minus ID, where the vertical velocity is zero, by just the substitution and using the Bernoulli equation gives you that this holomorphic function is equal to the bottom pressure. Exactly, actually that's why we introduce this equation. So this gothic P is an analytical continuation of the pressure at the bottom. But the analytical continuation of the pressure at the bottom is not the physical pressure in the fluid. The physical pressure and the holomorphic uh, pressure match only at the bottom. Everywhere else, there are different functions, okay? So we are going to deal with this uh, gothic uh, holomorphic pressure. I don't know if I should call that pressure, but uh, let's call it pressure and <coughs> comment. So we have to note that uh, the physical pressure P is neither the real or imaginary part of the holomorphic pressure, except at the bed. The physical pressure is zero at the free surface, but the holomorphic pressure is not and we have to find out what's the value of the holomorphic pressure at the free surface. So in order to do that, we consider the velocity, the complex velocity at the free surface, WS squared, and we replace it by its definition in terms of the physical velocity U and V. And with the surface impermeability, we have the second equality here. Okay, so now I will do uh, one big trick. I will multiply this equation by one. And by one, I mean 
1 plus ix over 1 plus ix. And then I rearrange this uh, product and I can rewrite it that way. Okay, so it's very elementary algebra. And then I can redistribute the u square here inside the left bracket and use again the surface impermeability. And I have this quantity. Okay. I, I actually have a question. I mean, if you, if you can go back, right? just one question about this gothic P. So you are yes. saying the gothic P is analytic, is a holomorphic, yes, right? by construction, yes. By construction, it is holomorphic, but on the boundary, on the bottom, it it is a real function, right? Yes. So meaning that the imaginary part is zero on the bottom. But then, does that, I mean, for me, that means that, uh, okay, uh, doesn't that mean that, uh, the, uh, okay, because usually, like, the real part and the imaginary part of a uh, complex of, uh, uh, or maybe that's an entire function, the complex, the real part and the complex part are related, no? Yes, but uh, uh, given a function f of x on a line, you can replace x by z and you get a normal morphic function. Actually, here you replace the x by z plus id. Okay. So it's a complex, I don't know how to say that. It's a complexification or an analytical continuation. Of yeah, the, gothic p is complex and you say it is holomorphic. And uh, okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I'm. I'm Little bit, uh, there's something I'm like, yeah, yeah, but maybe it's fine. Maybe it's fine. Okay. So, and by using the Bernoulli equation here, I have this uh, relation here. So, if I multiply by the denominator, I end up with uh, this equation. And at the free surface, uh, I have a, a relation between the, the velocity at the free surface and the gothic pressure at the free surface. Here is the relation that we get at once. And if I split real and imaginary parts, I obtain these two relations. And these two relations are ensured by the validity of the Bernoulli equation at the free surface. OK? And that's it. Game over. So now, how do we proceed? Just to give you an example. I have uh, data from the pressure at the bottom. And uh, if my uh, data look like a uh, discrete periodic wave, I can make a Fourier interpolation, for instance, of this data. So I can fit a Fourier polynomial of, to a certain order. Let's call it capital N. And I can determine the, the Pn by uh, least square minimization, for example. So I get from the data some uh, Fourier uh, polynomial uh, representation of the bottom. So I have an analytical here. I have an analytical approximation of the pressure at the bottom. And then I want to get my gothic pressure. So I just substitute x by z plus id. And then I have the, automatically the uh, uh, holomorphic uh, extension of the bottom pressure. That's very easy. Yeah? Replacing uh, x by z, I can do it. So. Now consider other type of uh, function for the bottom. Perhaps the Fourier, Fourier polynomial is not convenient. You will prefer some Jacobian elliptic function because they appear in the theory of water wave. So from the Knoidal wave theory of Kortovec and De Vries, you may want to fit an elliptic function where you have some parameter kappa, m, and a. You can fit from your data by a least square minimization or whatever algorithm you like. And once you get this uh, analytical approximation of the bottom pressure, then you do the complexification and you get your holomorphic uh, pressure here. And for a solitary wave is when M goes to one, you have this uh, expression for the holomorphic pressure, very easy. Of course, you can use a, any other basis of function you find uh, suitable for your problem. The idea is always the same. OK, so now you have the gothic pressure. And uh, you write it at the free surface. And you can start by the crest when it's equal to 0, where, the, uh, where assume that the crest is smooth here. 
So that gives you this relation, gives you an implicit definition of the amplitude. And uh, by fixed point iteration, you can solve this equation easily. And if you take the imaginary part of the equation one, you have this ordinary differential equation where derivatives here are only on the left hand side and the right hand side depends on both imaginary and uh, real parts of the gothic pressure, which depends on eta. So it's a nonlinear differential equation and you can solve it uh, directly numerically and iteratively. And the Bernoulli constant is given by the, that is unknown into the equation, is uh, determined by the condition of the mean water level. And we proved uh, that uh, this is converging. I will uh, go later on with a proof on uh, uh, another formulation that is better than this one. So I skip that for, for this part. So let's look at an example. Uh, I didn't have uh, data to process. So I created from a, a software, I have a numerical solution of a, a steady water wave. I consider a wavelengths of a depth equal to five, a wave out, uh, wave eight of a depth of 0.4, that's quite a large wave. And from this profile, I computed the numerically, I created, generated the pressure at the bottom and I sampled it with uh, 32 equally spaced point. And then I said, okay, this is my data, my synthetic uh, data. And I decided to fit a fifth order Fourier polynomial in this data. So here the blue circles are the synthetic data. And the red curve is the fifth sort of Fourier polynomial that has been uh, fifted by least square minimization within the data. So we see that it's uh, a proper fitting. And uh, that's the bottom pressure. And if you look in the Fourier space, I consider only the, the, force, uh, the force harmonic, the fifth uh, Fourier modes here. And the, the, the blue square, the exact one, and the red cross are the one fitted, so fitted. So they are quite uh, well fitted. And then I compute the amplitude by uh, basic fixed point iteration, because we can prove mathematically that the uh, fixed point, basic fixed point iteration is stable. So I did it numerically without trying to do anything smart. And you can see here the convergence of the fixed point iteration. So I get the amplitude and then I solve the equation numerically to get the profile and the blue one, uh, the exact, uh, surface data and the red one is the recovered surface and we can see that the recovering is quite uh, it's quite good so let's go back to this equation uh, it's much better than the equation uh, much simpler than the equation i've been presenting in the introduction by olivera central but still it's an equation and uh, i realized that actually we can solve this equation analytically of course when you have such a nonlinear equation, we normally you don't try to solve directly the equation. Since we have, uh, uh, sorry, I've been too quick. So uh, just a, a summary here where we explain uh, this recovery and I give you a reference uh, where you can find details about uh, this analysis. So let's go to the analytical resolution of this equation. Since I have complex uh, variable at my disposal, I will, try to go one step further with a, a, a complex uh, variable calculus. So in addition to the gothic P, I introduce a gothic Q that is an antiderivative of this P. Why doing that? But because solving an equation, it means integrating the equation. So it sounds, sound, a priori it sounded logical to consider uh, an antiderivative of the holomorphic pressure. And by definition, it's uh, just this quantity, which is also holomorphic. And I find convenient to choose Z0 uh, at the crest of the wave. It's an antiderivative. It's, uh, so there is an arbitrary constant and I can choose wherever I want. And if I do that and I compute the integral along the surface, we obtain by very elementary calculus, this formula here where I've been splitting real and imaginary part. And when you look at the function QS, you see that the imaginary part involved the free surface, but not its derivative, okay? So that gives me a reconstruction formula 
without uh, solving a differential equation. And that's it. That was the trick. So how does it work? OK, so if I take the imaginary part, I can solve it for eta. It's a quadratic equation. I can solve it. And here is the formula. Of course, it's an implicit definition of eta, but it's an exact solution on an implicit form. So it's a solution because there is no longer integral of a, or derivative into the formula. It's a purely algebraic. So how do we proceed? proceed? Let's go back to the bottom pressure with the Fourier interpolation. I do my Fourier interpolation. I do my first, my P gothic by replacing X by Z. And then I can, uh, to determine Q, I just have to compute an antiderivative. I'm computing, integrating an exponential. I can do it. Okay, so here we get it at once. If uh, instead if, of a Fourier, we want- I have um, a question, can I interrupt you? Yes, yes, about, of course. Yeah, about this holomorphic extension. So yes. you have uh, your gothic beta and which is holomorphic inside your domain, which is delimited by the bottom and the free surface. And you have this, uh, the other pressure PB that you extend. Yes. And if you want we, to get the same extension, we should, they should coincide at the free surface, no? Which one, the, the, the gothic yeah. pressure and the physical pressure? Yeah, yeah you have this, the first one, PBX, you have so this, uh, the holomorphic extension in the yes. plane. And you have beta, which is, uh, which is defined a priori, and which is Beta, you mean P here? Yeah, yeah, this gothic, this gothic pressure, which is holomorphic inside the domain delimited by the free surface, and not, not, yes. not, in, and uh, the question why they should they should coincide? They should they coincide on the bottom, but why they should coincide on the free surface in order to say that you have the same extension? No, no, they do not coincide at the free surface. The physical pressure is zero at the free surface, where the gothic uh, uh, pressure uh, is not zero. Yeah, but but why the gothic pressure is given by this expression inside? But it's defined like that, it's by definition. If, if I understand, it is defined in another way at the beginning, no? No, no, no. The, the gothic pressure, here, you look at the first line here. The gothic pressure, basically, you take the PB and you replace X by Z plus IB. That's the definition of the gothic pressure. So this is your definition of the gothic pressure inside? Yes. So you, you take the X, you make this substitution, and here you have the direct definition. It's by definition, it's like that. So this by definition, not, not so this is completely different from the standard pressure inside, which is not homomorphic. It, it's only at the seabed that the, they coincide. Everywhere else, the gothic pressure and the physical pressure have nothing to do <laughs> directly. So, so, bit, so the gothic pressure has nothing to do with the dynamics in some sense, a priori. This is just an extension and not more. It's an extension it of quantity. Capture, yeah, it does not capture the dynamics of the free surface for the moment. And directly, yes, because it's related. But, uh, but maybe later through the for, for a coefficient of P for the first one, this uh, okay, but you have to. Yeah, yeah, you have to add an information. You, you, you need an, an analytical expression to, actually the physics is encoded in the data of the PB here. So it's this, uh, this information is there and it's just extrapolated from the bottom to recover the, the free surface. I okay. don't know how to... to, to... Okay, so, okay, I see now, okay, thank you. So, and for the Q is just the antiderivative of P. So it's uh, like that. And so if you don't want Fourier series, you, you have another approximation like the uh, a, a knoidal wave approximation from PB, you have PZ, and you can compute the anti derivative, and you have an analytical formula here, where capital Z is uh, uh, Jacobi's uh, zeta function. And for solitary wave, you have a anal simple analytical expression for the QZ. So from your data at the bed, you feed them, you have the analytical interpolation, you make an uh, analytic. Uh, analytic uh, holomorphic extrapolation and uh, uh, an integration. And then you can solve directly the, the free surface. So you have still to determine the, the amplitude that is given like that as before. 
we can apply, since we don't have more der any more derivative into the, the system, we can apply the, the, the first uh, equation to the trough that defines the trough directly. And then we have an expression for the Bernoulli constant that is directly uh, uh, related by these two quantity and we don't have to compute an integral anymore. So it's simpler. So now let's look at the uh, convergence of this uh, uh, implicit formula. If I look at the, the, the crest, the determination of the amplitude, um, I can consider uh, y as a, a cord the vertical coordinate directly at the vertical under the crest. So if I define this function capital F, it's the real part of the complex pressure on the crest line here. And uh, I have to, to, to calculate uh, y by a fixed point iteration. And we know that the convergence will occur if the absolute value of df dy, the derivative, is less than 1. And uh, if we replace f by its expression and uh, we go back to the original quantity, we know that f, fy is 1 plus py, the vertical uh, derivative of the pressure, which is related to the velocity like that. And we know that this inequality has been proven in the literature. And that tells us that, that, tells us that uh, this condition is always fulfilled. And so the iteration will uh, converge. Uh, we can do the same at the trough. So we have the similar analysis at the trough, except that uh, we know an upper bound of this inequality, but we don't know rigorously a lower bound. It's still an open question. but. Uh, we have good reason to believe that uh, it, this condition is satisfied such that it converges. And the uh, numerical test shows that, but the rigorous mathematical proof is still uh, missing. Okay, so that's for the trough. Let, let's go to the free surface. So we do a similar analysis for the definition of our free surface, uh, define a new function capital G. And we define it like that. And as before, convergence occur if the derivative is smaller than one. And with my physical quantity and the definition of my quantity, the dg dy, the derivative is defined here. And uh, if I look at the lower condition for convergence, gy larger than minus one, it implies that we have this quantity that should be positive. Or oh, the pressure, p here is the physical pressure, it's positive. V square is positive and B is the sum of positive terms. So it is positive. So the lower bound condition is fulfilled. Now, if we do the same for the upper bound, the upper condition, we obtain this condition and P is positive and U square is positive. So it's okay, it's always satisfied, except at the crest of the highest wave. The highest wave is uh, the wave with an angular crest where the pressure is zero because the pressure is always zero at the free surface. And U is zero because when you have an angular crest, the crest is a stagnation point. So we don't have a strict inequality anymore. Uh, we have zero and it, we need to have a, a refined analysis for this case. Uh, if we can, uh, if the method can work even for the most extreme wave that exists. And this is the last part of, of the work. So, for doing that, the first derivative is not sufficient to, to decide if the iter iteration converge, and we have to look uh, further up to the second derivative. So that's what we obtain by direct calculus. And the point is that we have to estimate this second derivative, and we don't have theorem for that. But we have an asymptotic uh, uh, expansion from Stokes. We derive that for the corner flow, we call it sometimes a Stokes corner wave or corner flow. It's the wave of maximum height where with 120 degrees inner angle, perhaps you have heard about that. And when you do that, we know that the free surface is um, uh, behaving like that locally at the crest and the velocity uh, squared is behaving like that. And this has even been proven rigorously by uh, I forgot the name, but uh, this is uh, quite a solid result. So let's assume that at the crest of the highest wave behave like that, 
And if we plug this uh, approximation inside this condition, we find that the second derivative equal three over two A. And this is always positive because the amplitude is positive. And what it means, it means that iteration are semi-stable from below, uh, semi-convergent. So if you approach the crest from the fluid side, from under, it will converge. But if you approach from the top, it will be uh, the fixed point iteration will not converge. So these are just a direct exploitation of known results of uh, fixed point iteration. And this is the last part I did with my colleague, uh, David Henry. So let me summarize. So we have been uh, reformulating the, the problem. We obtain analytical solution. And this solution uh, allowed uh, easy numerical uh, computation. And uh, all that was permitted because we used complex, uh, complex function. But not only that, instead of dealing with what apparently seems natural, the complex velocity, we dealt with the, comp the velocity square and the Q function. So that was a simplification uh, brought by these uh, functions. So now let's look at the perspective and uh, uh, what can be done from that. So in the real life, we have uh, noisy data, outliers, and the situation are more complicated. And this is difficult for the surface reconstruction because uh, it's uh, ill conditioned and even uh, ill posed. Uh, it's easy to understand when you have data at the boundary, when you move away from the boundary, any errors tends to amplify exponentially. So if you have a lot of noise, this noise will amplify dramatically when you go away from the bottom. So that has to be taken into account. And uh, I'm not at all a specialist on that, but I know there are people uh, having technique for dealing with this kind of stuff. So that could be adapted for this problem. Uh, an extension that will be interesting is to consider unstationary uh, signals, not only permanent flow. So that's a uh, motivation for future work. And of course, in the real life, we know that uh, viscosity and wave breaking occur, so we cannot uh, uh, opt to solve analytically uh, everything all the time in every situation. But perhaps we can gain some insight or uh, bring the, uh, the, the, the complex problem to a, a form that is uh, more tractable than the direct uh, approach. Uh, this approach can be generalized for rotational flow. That's something I've been working uh, for some time now, and uh, it's in progress. So it's feasible. I just have to find the time to finish the work. And steady motion, I think it's feasible as well, as long as it's two-dimensional. The three-dimensional case is uh, more problematic. And it's interesting for application because uh, real C are 3D, not 2D. So. so this is more challenging because we don't have uh, complex uh, variables at our disposals. But we still have Green's function, series decomposition, this kind of tools that maybe uh, could uh, be used to, to bring the program into a simplified form as we did it. So that's uh, a research program for the future. And we have a lot of, on the way of mathematical questions. And mathematical questions are one thing, but me, I'm also very much interested in two effective uh, numerical uh, methods. Um, the goal, the ultimate goal is to have an operational system. So since it shouldn't work only in theory, it should work in practice. And this is a very long-term uh, thinking and way of research. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know how much time I spent. If I've been too slow or too quick, I don't know. That's good, very good. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Are there questions? Should I stop sharing because I don't see the chat? I don't know. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. You can keep it. I mean, it's fine. Are there questions? Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, DJ. Thank you for uh, this nice talk. So this is for the flat bottom and what we expect for uh, another topography, for example, periodic topography. Uh, this is much more complicated and uh, so far, but uh, I, I think it's doable but we, at some price because uh, the, the bottom pressure, it encodes some information, but uh, not everything. Uh, 
like in, in, when you add vorticity, for instance, you have one more parameter into the system and uh, you cannot extrapolate all information from the, just the pressure. So if you have a, a varying bottom, either you know it, the, you know the shape of the bottom or you don't know it. If you know it, I think it's at least formally, you should be able to do something. If you don't know it, then, uh, then it turns into black magic. So you have to, uh, to have some extra information. But uh, maybe you relate to the question, if we know the free surface in this case, can we get access to the bottom? Yes, this, and it's even more easy. Okay. So this, so this directly uh, this, okay. this is very much more easy because when you have information at the free surface, if you have noise, it is damped exponentially when you go down. While on the other way, it's amplified exponentially. So, and, and, and how to see the accident? For example, if the bottom is not continuous, there is some accident. How to see this discontinuity from uh, the regularity of the free surface? Can we get to? I guess there are some works on that, but uh, I don't know uh, exactly um, how you can do it. You can use, for instance, a conformal mapping. There have been some work on um, Constantine, for instance, he used conformal mapping to treat this problem because with conformal mapping, you map your, your geometry into a in simple, in simple one, like a strip. And then the problem is getting uh, simpler. The, the point is that it's mathematically simpler because the conformal mapping, you don't know it. What you know is the, the, the pressure at the bottom. And from the pressure at the bottom, you have to find the conformal mapping. You don't know it a priori. So uh, the, the, the simplicity uh, is just apparent because you have some extra work to do that is uh, complicated actually. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah, but uh, you what I know is that if you have some discontinuity this uh, to construct by fixed point theory, you should fix your function space. And if you have loss of regularity, maybe sometimes we can't make this scheme convergent. I'm not sure that uh, in general this works. I, I, I don't know, but you, you, if you add some discontinuity, you, have, you add some freedom into your problem. If you add too many freedom, uh, you need more information to compensate. If you have uh, one equation and three unknowns, you will not be able to solve your problem. You see what I mean? So. Uh, there are mathematical questions about the regularity and these kind of things. That's, uh, I understand. But also, it's a matter of information. Your problem has to be uh, well determined. So I, I cannot answer, I cannot tell you, oh, you should do that and that. Uh, you have to write down the problem exactly and to see what do you need to, to, to close the problem, at least formally. And then when you have that, you have to analyze mathematically if it's converging or not, if it's unique and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Okay, are there other questions? Uh, hi, I have actually a question um, about the convergence of the numerical uh, scheme. Do you have uh, some uh, issues uh, related to the size of the amplitudes uh, of the pressures are, uh, around the, the, the mean pressure and uh, of the amplitude of the wave itself, or like something related also to the depth of the bottom? Uh, I mean, suppose that uh, you are very deep. Okay. Okay, you have to make a very long extrapolation. The further away you move from the bottom, the more trouble you will get. Like, do you have also some kind of threshold uh, compared no, it's, it's to the other that, physical uh, quantities? It, it depends on the quality of your data. For example, I use a five order Fourier polynomial for the, the example. But if I use a thousand order Fourier polynomial, I mean, uh, there is noise in this. Uh, not, the, the Fourier coefficients are not well uh, resolved after some precision. So if you extrapolate, you will get. Uh, noise amplification so then you have to you need to you need accurate data to be able to extrapolate if not you amplify your noise 
So if you want to use a lot of Fourier modes, you will end up by the need to use quadruple or octuple precision. You understand what I mean? Because if even a tiny error on the bottom will amplify when you move away from the bottom. Okay, I see. So uh, it's not, uh, there is no threshold exactly. It depends on the quality of your data. And if you add some noise, the more noise you add, the cruder must be your, the, the most fitted must be your, your representation of the bottom pressure. It has to be smooth. So. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Okay. Yeah. If, you, if your pressure bottom, bottom pressure looks like a fractal, I mean, uh, no way you are going to, to, to do anything with that. Mm. Yes. That what I say, like uh, at a fixed number of uh, Fourier modes. Yeah, and the number of Fourier modes you can put depends on the quality of your of your signal. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, thank you all for being here and uh, thank you. Thank you very much for Thank listening. You. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, if you can send me your the, the, the preprint, I'm interested in having. Well, it, it's there. If you go on my webpage, they are available there. Okay. 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 Uh, Thank you. Bye. Bye all.